So on the panel, we have Rachel Lamy from Crossref, uh, Helena Cousins from Datasite, Martin Finner from Datasite, Katrina McCollum for Himdawi, and Danielle Lowenberg from California Digital Library. Uh, my name is John Chidaki. I'm also at the California Digital Library, and so I'll be moderating. Um, and our goal here is to really walk through some of the main issues that we, we see the, the community facing when it comes to data, capturing statistics around data uh, and building uh, data metrics. So the first discussion really is going to be focused on citations and the linking of data to publications and vice versa. And then we'll move more into some of the conversations around community and, and adoption and some of the, the hurdles that we have. Um, so first up is Rachel. Cool. Thanks, John. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to take a really quick whoosh through what um, I'm calling my continuing adventures in, in data citation. Um, I work at Crossref and our aim is to make research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess and reuse. Um, and part of kind of the learning curve is that I've been working more with um, the folks at Datasite over the last couple of years um, as we've been trying to um, also work with the community of publishers um, to help figure out ways to collect citations to, to data in a standard way. Why are we interested in doing this thing that looks looks very simple? Obviously, you know, a, a lot of you in the room, it's preaching to the converted and um, being able to, to find and, and link data to um, to other research outputs like like a journal article and um, helps with the transparency of and research um, reproducibility of the research and um, how the research is done. It facilitates reuse of the information so that we're not duplicating efforts. Um, it means that researchers can get credit for the work that they do. And, you know, another part of it as well is that in, in, in lots of instances, um, I think Stuart Taylor from the Royal Society mentioned it earlier, that publishers and funders are, are mandating re, um, data to be used in specific ways. Um, so having collecting that information in a standard way helps um, help see if that those those requirements are being met. I'm going to share the biggest reason for for articles to cite data in just a second. So hold on. Um, but part of what I've been seeing, these slides are from um, from Paul Wong at um, ARDC. Um, but if you work in the if you work in in publishing, if you, you the work you do touch publishing, you'll know that publishers are making real efforts to to link to the data from the research that they're publishing, because there's lots of code and data that's linked to published research. Um, and you can see again, there's a real growth in how many data related articles are being are being produced, um, which again talks to the reason actually we need to find ways as a community to be able to um, to be able to make that work visible um, and to to make that work visible and to support the work that researchers are doing with um, with their data. This is my main reason, um, and this is what this is sort of part of my journey is that the, the data is is already citing the publications. Um, we can see that in in spades, and certainly, and I'll talk. There's there's still work to be done there, um, but this has been a real eye opener for um, for me because um, we had to how, to how did I how did we figure this out? How do we know um, more than anecdotally? So this isn't going to show up that clearly, um, but one of the things that we've been working on at Crossref and collaborating with um, with Datasite on is um, is event data. And a really nice thing that event data does is it effectively, like almost in my head, um, it pre-filters a list of citations to data um, from Crossref. So if we see a data site DOI and a reference list in Crossref, um, it goes into event data. And data site are kind enough that when they see a, a, um, a link to a, a Crossref DOI in the data site metadata, they feed it in from, from their side. So I was talking to publishers about their work and they were saying, and what I could do is, what these queries are doing is I'm looking um, in the first instance, um, I'm looking at a Cambridge University Press paper, but looking from the, the data site side, I can see that there's a data set that's hosted in Pangea that's pointing to the data site, um, to, the, to the article. Those links aren't going the other way from publishers at the moment. 
Um, and the same thing. The second example um, is an um, again Pangea, and this time it's pointing to a um, to a paper in. Uh, at OUP. So the data is actively citing published content. Um, and I think what we want to do, like Liz Lizzie said, to, to sort of shed light in this is to have those links going both ways. And, and they're not at the moment. A lot of that is workflows. We, we love a workflow in scholarly publishing. Um, but in the, con in the conversations I'm having with, with publishers, they, they want to do this. They absolutely see the, the rationale behind doing this. Um, and there are just steps to take along the way that I've kind of highlighted in yellow. Um, don't have much time today, but again, there are published papers on establishing um, establishing policies for journals on on how you can share data from from quite basic requirements through to more advanced ones. And again, I know that um, the publishers are trying to move the journals up to the more advanced requirements in terms of, of sharing data, explaining to the authors how they should do that. I think the submission systems play a part in this to collect it in a standard way. Um, pass it through the production workflows, typesetting, copy editing, um, and then please give it to Crossref because sometimes that's where it falls out. That's what my little cars are illustrating, is that sometimes I can see data cited, I can see it in reference lists, and I look in the Crossref metadata for that piece and it's not quite there yet. Put links to data in your reference lists and, and event data will, will kind of do the rest so that the information can be, can be used um, can be used by computers as well as people. Um, I think that's my key message, and I know that um, that lots of publishers and submission systems, etc., are pushing in the same direction as this. I'm just an impatient person; I can't help myself. Um, and then the last thing, just to say that a lot of publishers have said, look, sometimes we, we've been aiming for perfection with this, and I think we'll all say this: what we actually want is progress. We're all trying to work. Um, everyone in the panel is kind of working through um, their own pieces of the puzzle on this. So I think we, we have to support the, the, the research community and help them work towards um, obtaining all of those benefits that I listed earlier in the presentation. And I'll pass to Helena. So one of the one of the common themes that you'll see through these presentations is that there is the perception of where we are with the linking of papers to data or data metrics or implementations of tracking the reach of data. There's this perception we have about where we are at, at this point in our journey as a Skullcoms community, and then there's the reality. So you know there is this idea that um, we are maybe further along or not as far along as we actually are. And so one of the things that we want to explore through the, these presentations is what is the actual state of the art in the state of where we're at. So next up is Helena Cousins from Datasite. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I definitely recognized uh, Rachel's adventures in data citation and I wanted to add some of my own. Um, as uh, John already said, I work for Datasite. Um, oh, I have to scroll. Uh, we're also a membership organization. And I think for the purpose of this talk, what's interesting is that Crossref mainly works with the publisher community. We mainly work with institutions and their repositories. So that means we're getting information from two sources. So we get information about citations coming in from publishers through Crossref, and we get information uh, from repositories through Datasite. And um, as Rachel also mentioned, for years, I think we've already been telling the story, please send us information about citations. We really need it. We'll aggregate it. We'll do something useful with it. And I mean, it is something that we see happening. So it is increasing. But I think one point <laughs> that we haven't made very often and that I want to make today is we're not simply saying send us a citation. We're saying when you deposit your metadata, we're asking you to indicate whether there's an, another identifier that's related to your data set. And when you do that, we also ask you to indicate what the relationship is between the publication and the data set. And that means we have very rich information but it also adds complexity because now we see this information coming in, but we have this whole list of possible relations between articles and data sets. And something like sites or is cited by seems quite simple, but there are other things that are farther removed from what we consider a citation. And I think that's really where we are now. We're seeing things coming in 
and we're starting to think about what a citation actually is. So this is sort of a brief overview of, of more recent information. As Rachel already said, we see a lot more coming in from repositories than from publishers right now. Uh, so repositories, I think, have been trying harder to find these links between articles and data sets. Uh, and if on the right hand side you look at the relations, um, these are just some examples, but it's quite diverse what we're seeing. So is supplement two is most popular now, but references is also quite popular and goes in the opposite direction. So I think you could already see that on the previous slide. There are two directions. So that's an additional layer that we're looking at. So our current thinking, and that's literally um, what we're thinking right now, because we're in the process of, of displaying this information we're getting, because we really see that as a next step. We get all this information and we need to share it with the community. So we're developing it literally this week, this month. What you're seeing here is in the data site search system, but still in test. And we do not just want to show a number. We actually want to show people what it means and what we see coming in. So we're not just saying there are four citations. We're actually saying, well, what we're seeing here is that according to this source, this particular output cites that particular output so that people can interpret themselves what this means and that they can also tell us what they think it should mean and what we should and shouldn't include. So as I said, this is really our current thinking. But what we're currently thinking is that not everything is a citation. We need multiple categories. Um, what we think are citations is when the data set says I'm referenced by, I'm cited by, I'm supplement to, or when something else says about the data set, uh, I reference, I cite, or I'm supplemented by this data set. And then we have another category for everything that goes in the opposite direction. So is the data set doing something to something else? And then all these other relation types, we're now putting in a bucket relations. But yeah, this is really something where we need everyone's input and everyone's help to figure out what this means and what this should look like. And so I think what we see as next step is following on from what Rachel told you, continue that work with the publishers to get as much information as possible. For the citations, we need to figure out what's in, what's out, when is something a citation. We want to work with repositories, so they also start displaying information and researchers can start seeing this. And then I think what you hear from the next couple of speakers is that we really don't think that these numbers are data metrics, and that is a very important next step. So thank you. Yeah, so hopefully um, from a, a discussion from you know the, the DOI registration agencies in our space, both Crossref and Datasite, you're starting to see, you know, maybe from your context that things are more developed than you had thought, or maybe things are less developed than you thought. So the reality is much different than perceptions in this space. So what we wanted to do now though is bring up additional speakers to not just talk about the implementation details of data metrics and the way we track the connections, but also talk about the cultural barriers and the state of the of our community when it comes to uh, building better practice in this space. So first up is Katrina McCullen from Hindawi. Yeah. Do you guys want to? I guess that people are all coming up, but the first speaker will be Katrina. Can you, yeah. Can you hear me? Um, so I, I wanted to pick up on a couple of themes um, at force today. One is the, the whole notion of open scholarship um, and, and what that is. And also to s talk to um, the scope model that Lizzie uh, just introduced before about uh, what it is uh, uh, putting what you value at the, at the top and what it is you actually value. And I think when we're talking um, about uh, metrics and responsible metrics, that um, the way we, we even start to articulate the questions um, is hugely impro uh, important. And um, one of the things, uh, uh, another re recurring theme throughout the conference, um, not just here actually, but in, in other recent conferences I've had, is that um, scholarship isn't just about outputs. It's about the process and practice of research. 
Um, and evaluation itself is actually considered in some quarters um, and by some disciplines as a dirty word. And, and what we should be talking about is recognising and, and rewarding rather than evaluating. And so in terms of, of just the data environment, what are the, the values that we want that will promote um, the sort of scholarship around data that we uh, or that the community feels um, is going to best advance um, uh, different disciplines or um, address certain questions. And I think this focus, in some ways, of taking, taking the focus off open, per se, and putting it more onto what is it that we value about scholarship um, might ha uh, help to sort of uh, generate some of that discussion uh, around what it is we value. Um, and in particular, when you think about uh, um, the opportunities that we have given the sort of uh, technological and economic uh, opportunities in the 21st century, um, what is it that we're actually asking of the research community in relation to data? And it is very much about the um, integrity of the process and the practice, um, the way that data is shared and collaborated, uh, and, and, and there is collaboration around data, um, as much as it is about the impact of any particular data output. And the, we know, um, fortunately, from lessons such as the um, impact factor and increasingly the, the, the H index, is that if you, if you put false proxies first, you get very perverse consequences. And um, so... And one of the fears, and I think this, we're not we're not we're not doing that because I think I think we are we are uh, um, much more aware of the context and, and the consequences of perverse uh, of putting in false proxies. Now, is um, for example coming up with something like the data impact factor. Now, that sounds bizarre and silly, but I have seen websites with data impact factor already in them. So what is the process that we can put in place, given that history, given the values around 21st century scholarship that, that uh, we want, and they might be different in different contexts and different disciplines, and then how is it that we reward and recognise um, the process and practice of data sharing as, and its robustness and its integrity, as well as the outputs. And I think that's really all, all, all I want to say is, is more about raising awareness. And there are lots of groups looking at responsible metrics and um, um, you know, as, well, as, as Lizzie's um, talk um, pointed to. And it it's really is, is what can we do as different stakeholders? So it's not just about spouting hot air, but how is it, for example, that um, uh, I represent a, a, a publisher? What is it that publishers can put in place to actually um, um, reward the, the process and integrity of the process as well as the outputs? And data citation and making sure there's both the backwards and forwards links is, is one of them. And having robust uh, data policies which um, outline ways for di da to cite data is another. And I, I think the, um, there is a really important message here that there is an ideal which we would all like to get to, but depending on your size and the state you are, it's, a, it's, it's not a straightforward road. And actually just getting off first base is good progress. Um, so at, in, at Indawi, we have a, uh, a mandatory data availability statement. We do not enforce it, and, and authors can actually um, uh, say data is available on request. That's not ideal, but it's a first step. And I think that's, that's the way we should be going. And same with um, the data metrics. We don't know what the answers are in terms of how we can qualitatively and quantitatively uh, measure the impact and the robustness of data workflows and data outputs. Um, but we need to start that conversation um, about how best to do it. And I think there's many more experts in the room um, who can speak to that, like Martin. So um, Martin Fenner from Datasite, do you want to continue the discussion? Thank you, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so just to continue where Katerina left off, I think in particular this community we have spent quite some time to uh, have community agreement and awareness that 
data sharing is important as is an essential part of scholarship. There's more work to do, but I think that's basically what we can assume that has been sorted out for many com many communities, many stakeholders. Uh, what you heard in the first two presentations is that we also have made a lot of progress in building infrastructure, um, both on the side of the publisher, on the side of repository, and of course there's much more work that we didn't go into and that the experts either room or elsewhere. Um, and as Katrina started to talk about it, um, Daniel and I will continue this. Uh, now we are at a point where we have to think about what comes next. And what comes next means um, where do we want to go with this and what does it all mean, collecting numbers from places. And uh, the statement I want to make in this these sh three short um, statements from the three of us is we have to push for open metrics. And um, the first problem is that's a horrible term because there's metrics in there and that's sort of already no-go for many. I think Ewan, uh, when he talked about alt metrics at a point, he said both words are actually a problem. Alt at metrics, I think the open is okay in this community, but metrics, of course, everybody hates it. But uh, we don't even have a term we agree on that we use in this conversation that go with open access, open data, open source. But without open metrics, all these don't really get that far because it's really part of scholarship, whether you like it or not. And we have other presentations like the one just before our session that go much deeper into what it is, means and where we make progress. But basically, it's not only about doing things in a responsible way and avoiding the mistakes that have been made before, but also if it's not open, it's basically, you will not get, get anywhere. And I think the time is now. It's not before we started talking about data share because it was too early and we shouldn't talk about this in five years when it might be too late because then we might have a situation where the data um, about metrics and what how you count them and how you value them, they're all locked up and then we we have seen this before with, with other kinds of metrics. Um, what is um, a nice position to be in when you're an infrastructure provider is that um, we can actually build the things. And because CrossWeb and DataSide are basically nonprofit infrastructure organization, by default, the things we are doing are open and that's in our mission, so we don't have to stretch ourselves. But of course, open is not just licenses and APIs and places, but it's also uh, that this is part of a community discussion. So we cannot make decisions of how this should look like. And the example that Helena gave about relation types, that's really messy. And we basically make a proposal and maybe in six months we realize that um, that there there's other answers to that. Um, and I will hand over to Daniela for the last presentation, which is sort of a group of people that hasn't really been enough involved in this discussion about data metrics. Yeah. So um, this <laughs> Daniela Lowenberg from California Digital Library. <laughs> I'm going to back up a step to say that um, maybe we didn't really give any background into what any of us work on in our day jobs, but um, we all work on a project called Make Data Count that some of you may heard of, and I will bring stickers tomorrow. Um, and it's a project where we had set out to build data level metrics. And so really, instead of theorizing what we're talking about here, this is based on our, ex on our experience of actually um, coming up with what we thought we were going to build for data level metrics. Um, and so building off of what Katrina and Martin each said, not only do we not want to repeat the mistakes that happen with articles, um, but we also need everything to be completely open and it needs to be completely open corpus that we can use. But on top of all of that, we need to not try and assign meaning right now. So if you've heard any of our presentations before, you may be familiar with the fact that we like to say there is no credit for data because we don't actually know what anything means. And so while we've built infrastructure for having these numbers that we display for views and downloads and citations, we actually have not and should not assign meaning to those numbers. As we learned in Lizzie's session right before this, there we could have these perverse consequences if we just go ahead and assume that data numbers are all the same across the board for every field or the same as they are with articles. And so what we believe needs to happen next is that we need the bibliometricians as experts to come in and start weighing in on what we've built for data. So we have a, a, an open corpus 
at data site now where we can be sending these views and these downloads and these citations and we need the bibliometricians to go in and actually tell us what do some of these things mean and we have to build from the bottom so when we've started to talk with bibliometricians about what we can do next they've said well this would be a really different experience for us because if you think about what happened with articles they went back and tried to find what meaning meant after the numbers were already there so what if we could actually start the process for data by figuring out what indicator makes sense? Is it views, downloads, citations, a combination, altmetrics? What are those things that we should be looking for? And what could they possibly mean? And how do they mean in terms of data sharing? Um, and so what we really want to drive is to understand how we as a community can all support that process and get on board with bibliometricians starting to tell us what some of these things might mean and how we can build from there. <laughs> okay, so um, just to, to step up, step back, so thank you for the panelists for their comments. Um, to stay, take a step back and just kind of go back to the original framing of this panel, right? So we had um, Rachel and Helena from Crossref and Datasite really talking through how we as a community, the pu publishers and repositories and people who are registering metadata around outputs, um, what is the progress that they're making and where are they right now? And maybe to some people's surprise, the progress is not as far as you had thought. Uh, many of the workflows are broken. Maybe some people already knew that. Um, maybe people think it's, it was actually worse. Um, many publishers who are depositing with Crossref don't know how broken it is, and they're still having to deal with the awareness of the issue. Same would go for data repositories with data site. But the reality is really that it's about this relationship building, right? It's about creating this relationship between these outputs and, create, and understanding what that relationship is. So it's very nuanced. It's not just as easy as citation. It's something about bringing these, these relationships together, and it's about um, knowing that this relationship building is still in, trans, is it still in development. We're, we're still in progress. So that's like the state of the art, the idea that we are still in the process of creating that, which really flows nicely into the discussion about where we're at more as a community and not as te te technical infrastructure. That, as Katrina was saying, that, you know, scholarship is not just about outputs, data metrics. You know, we, we need to find out what, um, what the values that we want to measure before we start say, assigning value. Um, and we need to find out what we, we do value because we want to make sure that we... Um, we, we learn from the past and we learn from um, false proxies. So, and then Martin, re continuing that with um, discussion about uh, how we've made progress with the technical infrastructure and we've made progress in data, data um, infrastructure and linking data and papers and other outputs, but we need to figure out um, where we go once uh, we've collected these numbers. What's the next step? Um, what are we aiming for? And, uh, you know, really a call to action of saying, like, now is the time, because as Daniela concluded, you know, we have projects like Make Data Count. We have initiatives that are trying to solve this problem. And there are many of us who are starting to see that the community is getting ahead of itself. Um, if we assign a meaning now to what is just raw numbers, uh, we, we will be making similar same mistakes as has been made in other in other sectors. And we know that it's time for us to kind of build something from the bottom up and, and get bibliometricians involved. So we need to figure out what these indicators are and we need to work on this together as a community. And so I wrap that all up because I want to kind of highlight this progression, right? From really understanding where we're at, everybody in the room really getting to understand where we're at and making this, this leap in this, building this infrastructure together. And also to frame it as a way for us to open up this discussion, right? So questions from you thinking through what, did, what surprised you in this? Um, what was uh, tragically apparent? What was tragically surprising? Um, what do you think around the ideas of uh, metrics and the future of metrics within uh, the data space? Thanks for a really interesting panel. It's enjoyable as always when there's metrics involved. Um, I, I, I wonder if, I, I really like the last comment actually about determining what metrics mean. And I guess what I'd preface this by saying is over a, a relatively long life now, I've come to the conclusion that the only place where one ring rules them all is in the Lord of the Rings. Um, and I'm thinking that the way to handle this is not to repeat the mistakes of the past, but to simply describe what each metric does um, for all their flaws. So to give an example, I thought in the very first talk, 
the point about H index, the thing that I found the most convincing on campus with people is to talk about what it does and what it doesn't do. So that it does indicate a kind of depth of citation perhaps on some articles, but it also indicates that you're old uh, as it rises. And I've found that academics are academics because they're really good at gaming systems. And if you indicate to them this is the strengths and weaknesses of this, I've, I've found that it's very difficult for them to knowingly misuse a, a, a metric. Whereas if you say, don't use h-index, it's wrong, or don't use the journal impact factor, it's wrong, then you get the dean who says, I don't care. Um, and so I'm wondering if maybe one approach would actually not be to recommend a, a metric, to say there are a bunch of different ways you can measure this, Here's their strengths and weaknesses. Really, you got to wonder why you're doing it anyway. But if you're going to pick and choose whichever poison you prefer, and leave it at that. Uh, so um, I think the question was um, the comment was um, that um, academia rewards old people, and um, yeah. And please, the, the panel, please uh, comment. Um, I think I think this is sort of. Yeah, this is of course the meat of this discussion of what's the sense of doing metrics anyway. Um, unfortunately, this is not always a sensible discussion. So if you bring people in a room and figure this out and how do we move forward as an open community, that's one thing. But then there's a tough world out there. I don't mean the um, weather in Scotland this time of the year. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at a conference where a survey was presented from the European Association of Universities asking all the universities, a very large number, how do you assess impact of your researchers? And it was very painful, and I'm sure there are enough people in the room that have seen this and contributed to this. So I think that's something we also have to struggle with. We have to do something that's reasonable, but still that sort of helps with what people are doing now to have a sort of gradual change instead of forget everything you do, let's do it completely different. That's at least my view. And the reality is quite at a different place of the discussion we're having here, or always have in force. And that's one of the challenges to how to move forward. And I'm happy to hear uh, answers to that, in particular from the university perspective. I mean, that's really the place where, at the end of the day, decisions are made how, how research is looked at. And, and also at this conference in Porto, uh, there was also a very nice keyword saying, excellence is killing science. So the basic idea that you try to measure something is already wrong, and that's a very reasonable statement. So, But how, what's, what's the practical way forward? That's, that's the challenge I see. And on a maybe more practical, like project-based sense of where we're coming from, um, it's exactly what the bibliometricians brought up when we raised this with them. And so actually the first studies that uh, we want them to be, and that they want to be focusing on is not which indicator is right, but actually they need to start way more baseline than that and eventually start building up where you could get to the point of saying this does this, this explains this, like you're saying, um, but not us just outright saying, you know, views and downloads are that and end of data metrics. Um, yeah, uh, please. One more thing I wanted to add is um, that's also, I think, because we very much agree, I think that's also why we've taken quite a descriptive approach now where we're just trying to say, look, this is what comes in and really just write it all down so that people can see for themselves what it is and it's not hidden behind some kind of number. Uh, and I don't know how that will continue over time, but at least for now, we really want to to take that approach and give people that space. Um, also, I think your your approach, um, as far as I understand, is 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 um, similar to that that uh, Paul Wooters, who's head of the um, expert uh, European Commission expert group on how to re sort of recognise and reward open science, is taking, which is a, is about uh, what is the process and mechanism, what are the frameworks needed to describe those metrics, to monitor what they're doing, and to have their consequences, and and not just uh, uh, you know present the metrics. So I I, th I think um, it's it's coming out just with as in the, the responsible metrics, and also last week there was the research on research um, institute announced. I I think the, the, there's many different voices all saying the same th same things actually in different ways, um, and it's just it's how how we actually implement those mechanisms and processes um, in a way um, that, that makes that apparent. 
Yeah, and I, and I would just add that there's just uh, there's a lot of you're, you're bringing up a great point around the misperceptions or the, the myth, but people not really understanding um, different indicators or understanding what is underneath of them or understanding what they're really based on. Um, and we I think one of the, the things we're highlighting is not just that that also is happening in the data space. Um, but that within this community, um, those that are educated, we are not um, fully understanding where we're at. And that um, very often we get into conversations, either people who are involved in the infrastructure behind scholarly communications or those that are working in the, uh, the building infrastructure for um, statistics around re reuse of and use of data, research data. We're, we're hearing people saying, well, I've already solved that, or I have this indicator already, or I hear this next thing is coming out and it's done. And it's a very scary prospect that that's what we as a community might very soon be just relying on things that at a very basic level are not based on uh, on anything that has um, been substantiated. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. You go first. Thank you. I didn't know there was more, more than one microphone in here. Um, I'm Lisa Fowler from the U.S. National Library of Medicine. Um, yes, over here. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about or if you're thinking about um, disciplinary differences in some of the um, dynamics to data citations and data reuse. I mean, we know from bibliometrics that there's really different patterns in different disciplines and, you know, just anecdotally working in um, the biomedical space, um, some of the repositories that we have are things that are, you know, sensitive human data. And so you have to actually like apply and say specifically what you're going to do with that data. So I think a download of that means something really different from a download of something that's like just out there for anybody to look at. So um, just curious if you could speak to any of that. Is that on? I, th I think the disciplinary uh, differences are really important because much of this conversation actually just uh, uh, comes from the biomedical community or the life science community and I completely um, appreciate that in terms of patient confidentiality or endangered species um, there has to be limits to openness and I think that's actually one of the conversations that we also need to be very upfront about that openness isn't a panacea that sometimes um, openness uh, can be harmful uh, it can even and can potentially limit honest conversation. And what that means around data is a conversation, I think, that, that, that w needs to be had uh, and appropriate expertise brought to bear on it. But the other um, uh, point that your question raises for me is um, the non-STEM non subjects and where does data scholarship and open data um, fit within the arts, uh, humanities and social sciences. And um, we, we all know that there is a huge amount of data within those subject areas. Um, and um, the, the qualitative uh, assessment of these types of data um, are probably going to be even more important than, than the quantitative. And I think the biomedicals tends to veer to the quantitative and, and the context is so important for other disciplines. I also think that there is a, a, a potentially a, an issue within some areas of the empirical humanities which are um, similar to um, that of, of the sort of STEM sciences. Um, I mean, it's easy to talk about a reproducibility crisis in, in, in STEM. Um, is there such a thing um, uh, going on in the humanities uh, as well? So I know there's one uh, philosopher um, at uh, the Free University in Amsterdam who is uh, talking about the, the, the need and desirability for rep replicability within the humanities. Um, again, speaking to um, the talk we had uh, this morning, um, um, from um, uh, Leslie, M Leslie uh, Macare, you, th there, there is a huge need, I think, for data around what is truth and what is evidence that can come from the humanities that we haven't yet tapped into. And I think this is all part of, of this sort of 21st century scholarship and the data that needs to bear on 
what is the data and evidence that we're bringing towards these arguments. And I think the humanities have a huge role um, to play in, in, in that. Uh, they, and they could help lead this conversation. But in terms of metrics, it makes it even more complicated and context-dependent and difficult and why we shouldn't put in simple uh, processes, I think. And I think, absolutely. And um, we are infrastructure builders and we're not bibliometricians. So what you brought up is what the bibliometricians that we're working with are what we want them to be exploring and anyone in the community who wants to get involved in exploring that with us. But that's what we're trying to point out when we say we have no idea what these numbers mean that we're having people display. And i just quickly add we can almost hope that it's obvious that discriminatory disciplines with data are so huge that nobody starts comparing them, as we routinely do with journal articles, leading to lots of unintended consequences. And even within the life sciences, I mean, you have popular fields that do lots of data. You have other fields that do that differently, and that's already a problem. So it's yeah, even in, in a fairly small focused area, I think you will discover with data that it's really so much case by case. There's one particular problem with data which breaks everything is that in contrast to a publication, you can slice a data set in many different ways. So you can have one data set or one million. Just slicing them enough. I mean, people slice papers, but this is a different business. So, right. so comparing is something that happens when we learn a little bit more of what people are doing, I think. Okay, so we have Cameron and then Robin. Yes, uh, Cameron Allen, and uh, so I guess one of the things we're doing research on in my group at the moment is actually the construction of meaning by communities, so bringing the semiotics <laughs> um, to the table. Um, one of the things that struck me, um, there's a gap here between a conversation that assumes, sorry, an objectivist universe in which things have meaning. <laughs> And those in and the social construction of this, where we look at the fact that we make meaning and communities make meaning. So one thing that I was troubled by, the bibliometricians cannot tell you about the meaning. The meaning is to be constructed by the communities that are using and producing this data. The bibliometricians are the professional experts in telling you whether this particular proxy or evaluative instrument actually tells you anything that's useful, consistent, um, precise, accurate about those values. Um, I think that's really important is that when Paul Vautis has made this, made this point about citations 15 years ago where he talked about the problem, that the problem is not understanding what citations mean. The problem is understanding what the indicators that we construct out of citations mean and how they get that meaning. Mm. And so the other thing that's, that strikes me that seems to be missing from the conversation, um, and particularly um, uh, driven by the work of Danielle Cooper and Rebecca Springer um, at Ithaca s &R on data communities, and data sharing communities that they've done. One of the things they found striking was that um, data sharing isn't actually about disciplines. It's about communities that share data that often form actually at the boundaries between disciplines. Um, and sorry, this is a question disguised as a mini talk. Um, <laughs> that, this is um, Cameron Neal and everyone. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I guess, though, I guess I'm, the question I really want to get to is how do we actually create the space? How do you create the infrastructural systems? How do we as a community create the space that allows these communities to construct meaning fast enough and well enough that we don't get sidetracked um, and what do we need to put in place to make that? I guess I'd also throw that question to Lizzie as well um, in terms of what are the structures that could make that work rather than having us get it wrong again when we knew what was coming. We knew what, well, Paul knew what we were doing and what we were doing wrong a long time um, before we could have fixed it. <laughs> right. Yeah, you want to start? Yeah, uh, so, so um, um, I, I agree because I, I, I think one of the things is, is we don't know. We, I mean, we, we don't know. So how do we explore that? And how do and there are lots of um, people um, working on this. And how do we bring that that conversation together? But the the, the thing that um, picked up on uh, uh, on me is 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 the time scale. Um, 
because we're at a juncture, can we, can we pause sufficiently long enough to do the work necessary to understand what it is <laughs> that we're measuring and doing and who is doing it before perhaps another organisation brings in a simple proxy that's easy to use that then takes over and and how do you I don't know I don't know the answer to that how 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 you can have this largely academic conversation at the same time when policy makers are just champing at the bit to get indicators just a, a small attempt of an answer um, we didn't tell you the whole story of what we are thinking of what happens it was just what we think are the next steps uh, something we totally missed out and it's a not an easy answer for data is qualitative assessment, peer review, and how does this fit into sort of more quantitative things? And of course, at the end, uh, bringing it all together with the community. That was sort of our vision that we presented uh, at another conference uh, a few months ago, that obviously, um, yeah, we're in the middle of it. We are not sort of in the final round. Okay, um, Robin? Okay, thanks. I think it was uh, the, f the first speaker, uh, was it uh, Rachel from Crossref? Yes. Uh, who was talking about um, we need progress more than we need perfection. And, and I was thinking uh, I could take, we could take it even farther than that to say maybe the best is the en enemy of the good really here. And we've been talking about the understandability of, of the bibliometrics on the output side. But um, my, myself and, my, and my colleagues here, some of whom are running around with the microphones, do um, uh, quality assurance on the input side you know, in an institutional data repository. And I think it's the same with both publications and data where in all these open outputs really rely on a lot of self-archiving. And you know, w what we find is that we really, for usability for the researchers to, to get them to finish the process of depositing, we need to make things as simple as possible they may not know about open licenses. We try and simplify that message. The metadata we try and simplify. Is it really important that that we have uh, that when they're talking about the data that they reference in a paper, whether it's cited by or referenced by, how can we simplify this so that we don't so that the numbers that we get out on the other end are not all wrong? As, it, as there was some implication that some of the numbers are coming out all wrong. So, you know, can we think about usability right back to the beginning when the self-archiving and, and the burden that we put on the researchers in doing all this just to make their outputs open, which is not their main goal. Their main goal is to do the research. Um, I certainly, I, I certainly agree, and I think um, I would say sort of from the, um, the collection side, a lot of what we're what we're talking about is there's absolutely the, the repository side and, and making that easier. Um, I think just to pick up on one of the points that I'm seeing is um, as well is that there are also a lot of um, you know we, we ask we ask researchers to provide lots of information when they submit to when they submit to to a journal. So it's making like the the journal policies you know clear, understandable, helpful. But then the other part as well is when when authors actually are submitting to a journal is is integrating that the collection of that information just trying to make it as easy as possible and part of that that workflow so i know um you know from the dryad side again there's conversations about um with like manuscript submission systems about actually how just to make that part of a, a standard workflow so the information just gets collected and sent on rather than sort of workarounds or asking for information after the fact when when people you know <laughs> When that's done, and I've I've submitted that manuscript, that's just one little piece. I know you were talking from the the repository side as well, and I'm sure um, one of one of my co-panelists can talk to that as well. But I think I agree; it, it needs to be seamless, and we're not we're not there yet. But but it's always hard because it always has two sides. On the one hand, we want to make it as easy as possible to increase adoption. On the other hand, um, people also want that sort of richness of information and want accurate information and want to have the option to distinguish between different things. So even though people ask us to make things easy, people also ask us to add enough options for them. And I guess that's all part of the process to find the right balance there, I think. 
And, and that speaks to, to other issues like the Enabling Fair Data Project in, in terms of how you get data, a data set even before you even download it or cite it in, in a state that actually is shareable and reusable and there's whole issues around the reporting and integrity of data sets um, the, 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 that uh, is, is beginning to be, to be had, um, um, which extends into sort of experimental design and the sort of openness of methods and there's all that sort of side um, that is as important as the output side. Yeah, so um, I mean, one of the goals that we had with this discussion, did you, did you have? Yeah, Ted, Ted. yeah we're, um, I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> I'm sorry that there's more questions, but we're out of time. I know that the panelists would love to continue the conversation with the audience. At, uh, throughout the rest of this event. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the things we were really trying to do with this uh, panel was to open up a discussion and, and uh, like transparency about how, where we are right now with um, tracking metrics around research data. And also to hopefully bring a healthy skepticism to those that don't already have it um, about where we're at and what um, indicators that may be being pushed onto us or that maybe are being seen out in the landscape. Um, you know, wh what they're really based on. And so that we can, as a community, push back on this idea that we've already achieved data metrics um, or that we're even close. And so hopefully that, that has resonated. And so thank you to the panelists for um, their, their expertise and thank you very much. <laughs>